Steve, we need to talk about Christian Porter. I'm not even sure where to begin. Welcome to Keep the Bastards Honest, the podcast of the Australian Democrats. I'm your host, Alana Mitchell, and on this episode, is former Attorney General Christian Porter taking our democracy off a cliff? Over time, governments take on a certain character. It's why, when we look at the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison governments, they seem like three distinct and separate entities and not a single eight-year-long administration, which is what they are. In hindsight, the Abbott government is seen as misogynistic and climate change denying, and any achievements the Turnbull government had are overshadowed by the civil war that was waged over climate action, which cost Turnbull his job as leader of the Liberal Party for the second time. The Morrison government is developing a clear perception of being secretive and averse to transparency, and in particular, deeply averse to accountability. When the press gallery starts openly wondering what a cabinet minister has to do to warrant being sacked by Prime Minister Morrison, you know something's rotten. Because openly rotting billions in taxpayer dollars to buy votes in the 2019 election isn't it. Designing a wage subsidy scheme that was legally rotted by big business for even more billions of dollars isn't it? Not ordering enough vaccines, screwing up the rollout of the ones we got, and being responsible for hundreds of avoidable deaths as a consequence, isn't it? And being credibly accused of historical rape, isn't it either? However, recording in the Parliamentary Register of Interests that you accepted an anonymous donation of an unknown amount of money but an amount that could reasonably be expected to be anywhere from half a million to a million dollars through a blind trust just might be it. I asked my Democrats colleague Steve Beatty to join me in pulling apart the latest scandal surrounding Christian Porter. We recorded this conversation on Wadjuk and Gadigal countries respectively. We pay our respects to the traditional owners of these lands and their elders past and present. Sovereignty never ceded. So, Steve, as we said at the beginning of the podcast, we really, really, really need to talk about Christian Porter. And there is so much to talk about. Yes. Uh, So what I was thinking I would do, just for those listeners who may not be fully across this, who, who have probably seen Christian Porter splashed all over the nightly news, but are wondering what on earth this latest scandal is. So I'm going to use the trope from the, you know, the Phantom comics where they recap and go, for those that came in late, this is what's going on. So back in, I think uh, it was November last year that the Four Corners aired an episode called Inside the Canberra Bubble. And In that episode, they had a story around Alan Tudge and his having an extramarital affair with one of his staffers and his subsequent bullying of that staffer. That's a separate story that we can't get into tonight, otherwise we'll be here for hours. The other half of that story, the centrepiece of that was supposed to be this question of the rape allegations against Christian Porter, but the ABC couldn't get it past their lawyers. So it ended up being a sort of oddly not disappointing, but oddly sort of un, 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 unfulfilling story about Porter's sort of pattern of misogyny and pattern of misogynistic behaviour over his life from university through to the present day. And one of those things was him being caught out in public with a young staffer who was not his wife yes. and clearly in some kind of an appropriate relationship with her. So that particular bombshell drops. Then we fast forward till I think it was like February this year. And Louise Milligan, who was the journalist at the centre of the Four Corners episode, writes an article saying that an unnamed cabinet minister has been credibly accused of a historical rape of a teenage girl back in the, I think, late 80s, early 90s, when he himself was a, a, a teenager. And Twitter, of course, 
lost its mind and all the all the twenty people put their detect- detective hats on and worked out fairly quickly that of the handful of of government ministers who are the right age and you know in Sydney at the right time, they worked out through probability that it was Christian Porter. And then a few days after that, Porter outed himself to the media in a very, very teary media conference and then immediately went on sort of two weeks mental health leave because he was clearly so traumatised by all of this. Then, in the meantime, we had the Brittany Higgins story break and the women of Australia got really pissed off. And within two weeks, an extraordinary event was was organised, which was the March for Justice. And the day of the March for Justice in Canberra, Porter returns to work and announces that he's suing the ABC and Louise Milligan personally for defamation. And so far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah. Then, so, and and we'll get into what on earth Prime Minister Scott Morrison was doing about all this in the meantime, but this is just a quick timeline of events. So Porter sues the ABC for defamation. Eventually the case ends up in court and the ABC present their defence, which under defamation law you have the the option of defending of of presenting a truth defence, which is what the ABC took. And as soon as Porter saw the ABC's evidence, he immediately sued to settle the uh, settle the case. Then he fought to have the evidence completely suppressed so that nobody could ever report on this, and it's sealed within the court record. And deleted. yes. Yes, not just redacted, but deleted, I believe. Which is phenomenally rare and even in itself, that's remarkable, but Mm. that's not even the story. No, no, but wait, there's more. So then we've just found out this week that Porter's legal bills have been paid by a blind trust. Now, in legal terms, this is a trust where the beneficiary of the trust has no visibility over the assets in the trust, and the executor of the trust is the one who directs where the money goes and all this sort of thing. It's common in the US where presidents will put all of their assets into a blind trust and relinquish control of their assets so that their their decisions as president aren't seen to be enriching them personally, which of course is a convention that Donald Trump completely trashed. So Porter very casually put onto his register of parliamentary interest that he is the beneficiary of this trust designed to help him pay the substantial legal fees he incurred as a private citizen suing our national broadcaster for defamation. And everybody who has an interest in accountability and transparency has lost their minds this week because, and apologies for the language, this is bullshit. So let's let's dive into that a little bit because what we have is a federal minister whose legal bills on that defamation case against the ABC and against Louise Milligan are estimated to be somewhere between $600,000 and maybe as much as a million dollars. And that's to pay for his lawyers, solicitors, a barrister to represent him in court, you know, all all of the work that goes to a, a major case like this. We know that as part of the settlement with the ABC to make the case go away, and it wasn't a win and it wasn't an admission of wrongdoing on the part of the ABC, but they reached an agreement that we will no longer uh, pursue this case. Porter will no longer pursue this defamation case. The ABC contributed, I think it was $50,000 towards his legal fees. That leaves a substantial amount still to be paid. In his register of interest, it just Earlier this week, Christian Porter updated it to indicate that this trust, which he doesn't know who is behind, contributed an amount of money, which he has not disclosed, to contribute to his legal fees. Now, there are there are massive problems with this, but ministers are meant to be guided by the ministerial standards. So as a minister, you you swear an oath to to parliament to fulfil your duties and you agree to be bound by these ministerial standards. Now, these are updated from time to time and this version of it is from August 2018. So these current for the current uh, ministers. Let me read the section on gifts. So section 2.22 of the ministerial standards on gifts says ministers must not seek or accept 
any kind of benefit or other valuable consideration either for themselves or for others in connection with performing or not performing any element of their official duties as a minister. Now, whether Porter uh, received the money himself or whether that money was paid by somebody else to his lawyers to cover those legal fees, so someone not cover the bill, then this applies. And the same would apply if I took a federal minister out to dinner and said, I'll pay for dinner. If it was worth an amount of money, it would still need to be declared as an interest just in case. So it goes on. Ministers shall ensure that they do not come under any financial or other obligation to individuals or organisations to the extent that they may appear to be influenced improperly in the performance of their official duties as minister. So it's the appearance of impropriety rather than necessarily an actual obligation or an actual obligation that they might have to somebody else or to an organisation. Now, we don't know who's behind the money. The disclosure of interest says, I don't know who's behind this trust. I don't know who put the assets into it. I'm just stating that I'm a beneficiary of it. But he also hasn't disclosed the amount of money. Now, from what we know, his legal bills, less the contribution from the ABC, could still be close to a million dollars, like $950,000 or $550,000 at the low end of that estimate still hasn't been accounted for. There are huge problems with this. There are huge problems with this. No one is currently accusing Christian Porter of having something, having done something inappropriate. What everyone is frothing at the mouth about, he has complied with the absolute letter of the parliamentary registration, uh, uh, register of interest thingy. That's the one I was looking for. Yes. But he's, he's not. Of. So, yeah. Yeah. And like only just like he has gone to the nth degree on doing the bare minimum on complying with those requirements. He has not complied with the spirit of them because oh, the no. first question that everyone has asked the minute they, that was revealed to the media was, well, who's behind this? It could be the mafia. Yeah. It could be the Chinese government. It could be any number of criminal organisations. It could be any number of very rich people who are looking for a quid, quo, quid pro quo from Porter in his position as a cabinet minister, either now or down the track. And nobody has any way of knowing. Porter wants to maintain this thick leaf of suggesting that some well-meaning and entirely ph philanthropic and people without an agenda have, out of the goodness of their hearts, stumped up hypothetically close to a million bucks to settle his legal fees and expect nothing from him in return. So fine, right? Yeah. Let's let's say that's true. Let's say that Christian Porter has friends with enough money that they would help him out to the tune of half a million bucks, 900,000 bucks to cover his legal bills because he would otherwise be hard up. And they have said, look, don't worry about it. We've we've got you covered. Let's assume that that's, that's the case. And I think we would all love to have friends with half a million dollars lying around that they, they didn't need and could just give away. Let's say that that's true for a minute. Why won't they disclose that? Like, why not say, my friend, such and such, has given me $600,000, $500,000, $800,000 towards my legal costs because they're a friend? Why not disclose that? Why keep that part secret? And, and why are those people not wanting to go on the public record as saying Christian Porter is a fine, upstanding man and who has been terribly defamed by this whole process and I'm putting my money where my mouth is and supporting the guy? The fact that these people want to remain anonymous raises a whole other bunch of questions. Let's, let's take it a step further. So let's say we accept in this instance that Christian Porter is allowed to accept an undisclosed amount of money from an unknown source and that it becomes acceptable, it becomes okay for our parliamentarians, our MPs, our cabinet ministers, the prime minister, the deputy prime minister to accept money and simply make a note on their interests that, oh, look, I, I, I received some money from someone, but I'm not going to disclose that. 
the impact that that has on the operation of our democracy is toxic. It is fundamental. It goes against everything we as a nation stand for in terms of a representative democracy, of a liberal social democratic state. The idea that our politicians are receiving money, uh, not donations, but just receiving effectively gifts to the tune of tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars from people that don't have to be properly disclosed sets a horrible, horrible precedent. I mean, we have issues with transparency as it is. There's a, a legal argument going on at the moment and a battle, uh, you know, a freedom of information battle and uh, a lot of effort going into trying to uncover where the allocation of funds for the commuter car park that's been called out by the Australian National Audit Office as being highly irregular you know, we, we still don't have details around that. Like, this is a, a very secretive government. As it stands, the idea that a minister is able to accept money in this kind of way and not be forced to disclose it or stand down is 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 really, really troubling. It's, it's mind-bogglingly troubling because our, our national president, Len Allison, said to me today, anonymous political donations are illegal. And they're illegal for very good reasons. And this is not a donation in the true sense of the word because it is a private gift to Christian Porter as a government minister. It's not a gift to the Liberal Party, of which he's a member and a representative. But the reasoning behind making anonymous donations illegal does stand in this case. This is why this whole thing stinks to high heaven. And and let, let's also, I mean, this will probably be a, um, a subject for another podcast is as, as to why our donation laws are terrible and weak and, and anyway, not fit for purpose. Yeah. But the, the one thing that they do have in place is that anonymous donations are illegal and they're illegal because if you're going to be seen to be contributing to the political process and seeking to either curry favour or influence or or seek policy outcomes, you've got to put your name to it. So we know who you are, what you represent, and why you might want the policy outcomes that you're seeking, and whether it's in the best interest of the nation. And there's a whole other argument that political nations should be banned and political funding should come from the taxpayer, which we could probably cover again in another podcast episode. And and it's mind-boggling to me that Porter thinks he can get away with this. The entitlement, yeah, it's... That's the troubling thing. One of the many troubling things in this particular sorry tale is that he thinks that it would have gone through, that it wouldn't be picked up, that it wouldn't be problematic, that it wouldn't be an issue, that he can just shrug and say, look, I, I don't know who's behind it. So like, if you think about, I log into my bank account on a semi-regular basis to make sure that I've got enough money to do things like buy groceries and that kind of thing. If I found a large sum of money sitting in my bank account, I would want to know who had put it there. If it wasn't me, and it won't be, but if it (laughs) wasn't me, I would want to know where it came from. And I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with the idea that at some point in the future, someone might tap me on the shoulder and say, listen, that money was from me. And here's what I want from you in return. Yes. I just want to read you something from Andrew P. Street. He, he did an article on his Patreon about this, which is as many things that Andrew P. Street writes is absolute gold. But he says, I mean, if a million odd dollars unexpectedly appeared on my doorstep, I'd be terrified since I'd assume that yes. even in the best case scenario, there were some very, 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 very unpleasant strings attached. However, honest Christy P., evidently has a no-mouth examination policy with his gift horses, which is frankly refreshing in these oh-so-cynical times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Much love to Andrew P. Street for absolutely nailing the preposterousness of a potential anywhere from a half a million to a million bucks turning up in your bank account, and you're not questioning that. My younger daughter asked me this evening, how is it possible that someone puts money into your bank account without you knowing And I thought that was a good question because our bank account details aren't public knowledge. It's not like I can just walk into a bank branch and say, look, I want to deposit some money into Elena Mitchell's account, but I don't have the details. Could you tell me, please? 
those details need to be handed out. And they're typically handed out in response to a request for those details. So the idea that this arrived, whether it's to the lawyer's accounts or to Christian Porter's directly, unbeknownst to him from an unknown source, I give my bank account details to people all the time. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which of them might have given me half a million dollars. Seems credulous. Well, this is it. I mean, and Porter sort of argued that he has no idea who the people were who contributed to the blind trust that has paid for his legal fees. But the thing is, there has to be an executor of that trust. There has to be a middle middle person who is directing be a, trustee. Where, a trustee. That's the word. Yes, that's exactly the word It'll I was looking for. Be. Yeah. yeah. So why was not the trustee listed in his parliamentary register? At the very least, I mean, again, let's play along with this fig leaf that Porter's got no idea who's actually stumped up the money. He has to know who the trustee is because the trustee would have had to have reached out to him somehow to say, hey, I've got this massive windfall for you. What's your bank account details? It's it's not credible that he doesn't really know who's behind the trust, either who the trustee is or who's behind the, the trust and who's funding it. So let's just set that aside for a moment. If he really doesn't know, then the proper thing to do is give the money back. It's, and, and, it's, and it really is as simple as that. I'm a federal government minister. I can't accept money from an anonymous source. I just cannot. I need to give that money back. And you contact the bank and you say, wherever that came from, send it back again. Like re- reverse that transaction. I don't want anything to do with it. The bank absolutely knows who that entity is. Let's just be clear about that. The bank knows who they are, but the bank could easily reverse that transaction. If you are going to accept it, then you've got to disclose who it is and how much it was. And if you don't want to, and it's quite clear that he doesn't want to, then we all have every right to question why not. Mm. And the thing that had me... Seeing red on this issue, and, and and which is why I reached out to you and said we need to talk about Christian Porter, is the fact that he, when this hit the news and he'd, he'd put this onto his parliamentary register, he said he was doing it out of an abundance of caution. So he's presenting himself as being honest Christian, you know, honest Christy P, as Andrew called him, being transparent, being open and accountable, out of an abundance of caution, just in case this might be an issue. And that's the moment when my brain melted down because it's like, are you kidding me? Please. (laughs) Please. Just in case, just in case this might be an issue that an unknown entity is giving me loads of money. I just want to make it known that that happened. I mean, that's, it's, it's absurd. It it really is absurd. And as I say, like it it defies belief. Uh, I'm not sure who he, you know, who he thinks he's, he's fooling on this one, but it's wrong. And then you have this, I'm not even sure what the right word for it is, but there's the the response from the Prime Minister to say, I'm receiving advice as to whether or not this might be a breach of ministerial standards, as though under some circumstances, an anonymous gift of a large sum of money might be acceptable is absurd. Oh, yeah. Let's not pretend for a second that the rest of the government, the rest of Porter's colleagues are not taking the piss in equal measure on this issue. Because you have Morrison buying time for himself and going, I'm seeking advice. I can't possibly comment on this. And then the number of citizen journalists who have gone, can I just point out ministerial standard 2.21 and Mm 2.22, just just to shortcut this process for you, Mr. Morrison. Then the Treasurer of Let me help you out. Yeah, exactly. And then the treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, went on Sky News and just went, it's okay, guys. No taxpayer money was involved in Porter's defamation action. So it's all good. Like, nobody asked okay. about that. We all, it was a private matter. I mean, the fact that the, attorney, the then Attorney General felt it was necessary to sue the public broadcaster is another issue entirely. But no one's pretending for a second that, yes. that the government funded that action. So that's utter bollocks as well. Yeah. The more you sort of tease at the issue, the worse it becomes, in my view. I keep thinking about it on and off as the week has gone on, and the angles that you come at it get worse and worse. Yeah. But they don't get better. There's, no. I, I haven't for once sort of sat there this week and gone, actually, you know what? 
if you think about it this way, it's kind of okay. Yeah. Not once. No. Yeah. As you said, the more I think about it and the more I think about it in terms of, you know, as Lynn pointed out to me today, the comparison with our donation laws or we are a political party that is obsessed with accountability and transparency and honesty. Not that there are any redeeming features to this, but, you know, the the possibility of there being any redeeming features becomes vanishingly small. It, it was interesting to see former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull come out during the week quite adamantly stating that this was wrong, that Christian Porter needs to resign, that it's it's not OK. There's no way that it can be made to be OK was quite interesting. He was very adamant in his position on it. There have been many other commentators along similar lines who've made it quite clear that there really is no, as you say, that there's no redeeming angle to this. We're recording this on a Friday night, which means the, the Prime Minister has bought himself a weekend where hopefully something else crops up to distract from the issue. They tried, you know, big announcement about nuclear submarines to distract us. Let's talk about this, which in itself is a whole other thing, but it is cultural within our current government that there is an acceptable level of simple obfuscation and secrecy that they can undertake about pretty much everything, whether it's pretending that the National Cabinet should be cabineting confidence and that they don't need to share the deliberations, whether it's not sharing information about the way in which public money has been dispersed with the sports, uh, community sports grants or the community of fund, if we sort of cast our mind back a little while and think about Barnaby Joyce mm. as water minister, water envoy, I think he racked up like $600,000, $670,000 in travel expenses touring around uh, the Murray-Darling in exchange for three text messages that no one has ever seen, but he, mm. he swears he, he sent as though that's an appropriate response to $600,000 of public money. The reflex to hide is phenomenal. If they spent as much energy trying to do good instead of spending that energy hiding things, we would be so much further ahead. Oh my God, yes. But there's been so much brilliant commentary on this issue this week. I did, there's one more one that I want to read to you. This is from Michael Bradley from Mark Lawyers writing in Crikey. I feel like I'm sort of hammering this issue, but I just want to really put this in context for our listeners who probably haven't been obsessing over this the way you and I have because they've got better things to do with their lives. But this analogy that Bradley uses is exquisite. Say Porter's declaration is compliant in that he has declared his interest to the full extent of his knowledge and can't say more because the blind trust structure prevents him from knowing more. And say his mystery benefactor decides to set up another blind trust called the Car Services Trust. They put a fresh bucket of money in that trust, appointing a trustee to decide what to do with it. And that trustee decides to use it to buy Porter a Ferrari. One day, Porter comes home and finds a Ferrari in his driveway with a note on the windscreen saying, with compliments from the Car Services Trust, which, by the way, is a blind trust. Porter, properly updates the register to disclose his receipt of the car, noting that it came from a blind trust, and as a potential beneficiary, I have no access to information about the conduct and funding of the trust. He doesn't even know who to return it to if he doesn't want to keep it. Facetious, of course, as if that had ever happened. But how long before other MPs start making disclosures of donations they've received from blind trusts? If Porter has found a viable loophole, there is nothing to stop the blind trust structure from being used to make all kinds of completely opaque gifts to politicians who won't yes. have to disclose the ultimate source because they ostensibly don't know who it is. It's not even a slippery slope. It is a mm. cliff. Yeah. We are on the edge of a cliff. If this is allowed to go through and this is allowed to stand, and really, like, there are really only three courses of action. Porter resigns, he hands back the money, or he discloses who it's from and how much it was. And then maybe we take a look at, well, who is it from and how much was it? And was that appropriate in itself? But yeah. those are the only three courses of action. The idea that we can go, actually, it's all okay, is... We're stepping off a cliff in terms of the, the functioning of our democracy, to put it quite bluntly. 
Yes. And if we as the Australian public end up in a position where we go, yeah, actually, that's okay, then we can literally kiss democracy goodbye. We have assisted other nations to invade sovereign nations in the spirit of providing those nations with free and fair democracy, rightly or wrongly. And if we step off that cliff, then the likes of Iraq and Afghanistan might feel the need to come in and invade Australia and help restore our democracy to us. And I realise that sounds ridiculous and a joke, but that is literally the level that we're at. Because if the government gets away with this, you can kiss goodbye. There is no bottom. And anyone who thinks that the Labor Party will find it in themselves to not dive off that cliff after the coalition and seek that endless bottom are kidding themselves because once it becomes permissible for one political party to do it, there is no reward in being the party that stands up and goes, oh, no, there is actually a line that we won't cross. We've discussed recently the moves by the major parties to set up a a cushy little cartel for themselves where their own interests are are, are protected and and the interests of of others and and the country are, are set aside somewhat. This one's an absolute no-brainer. I mean, as, as a party, we are here to keep the bastards honest. It's, it's in the tagline. And this is exactly the kind of stuff that we're talking about. Mm. This sort of thing, this ability to accept donations from who knows where in return for who knows what, and the appearance of impropriety here is enormous. And we have to fight against it. We absolutely have to fight against this kind of move because it really is a cliff that we would be stepping off. Everyone's heard of Keep the Bastards On Us. We've had innumerable other political parties and political actors try and adopt that tagline to set themselves up as as arbiters of truth in Parliament, rightly or wrongly and successfully or unsuccessfully. And this is a absolute epitome of what it means to keep the bastards honest. And members of our party and members of the public have objected to keep the bastards honest. They think it's disrespectful or like not becoming of uh, of, of politics in Australia. And I understand and, and respect and appreciate that perspective. But when we talk about bastards, we're not talking about Christian Porter in the sort of traditional sense of someone born out of wedlock. When we talk about bastard behaviour in the context of keep the bastards honest, this is literally what we're talking about in that this is selfish, self-serving, works against the foundational principles of a fair and free democracy and works against the interests of the country as a whole. And this is... Bastard Behaviour 101 and Christian Porter is a capital B bastard in the context of that word. And when Don Chip and the other founding members of, of our party stood up and said, we are here to keep the bastards honest, this is, exact, as you said, exactly what they meant. And it is fascinating to watch. I mean, my political awakening didn't come until after John Howard had, had left office and, and we had civil war in Labor over the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd governments. And our last parliamentary representative left Parliament in 2008 when her, when their, their Senate terms ended. And since that moment, from 2008 to the present day, there has been a really dramatic decline in the standards and propriety and also the trust in our politicians from the public. And you can... Oh one, one of you know one of one of our membership officers has sort of almost charted the decline in that political trust from the moments the Australian Democrats left the parliament. And I realise that cause you know correlation is not causation or vice versa. But I don't think that's a coincidence. I mean, the cracks started appearing in Australian democracy once we left parliament. And I don't feel that that is a, a massive coincidence. No, (laughs) it's not, it's not. Hello, wonderful listeners. Editing Alana here. As you would have noticed over the weekend, there was a rather large update on the Christian Porter saga, which required Steve and I to return to the mic and continue our discussion. Anyway, enjoy our impromptu part two of the podcast. Thanks. Bye.
So, Steve, we first started recording this on Friday, the 17th of, of September, and we thought we were all done and dusted and wrapped up and we we're waiting to see what happened next. And as you predicted in the podcast, we had the weekend to wait and see what happened next. So we're back on Sunday night during an update. What's happened? Why are we still talking about Christian Porter? Christian Porter has resigned from the ministry. Now, let's let's sort of walk through this a little bit because it's it's important to understand just exactly what's happened. Prime Minister Scott Morrison earlier in the week said that he would take advice on whether or not any of the ministerial codes of conduct were breached and that he would not act until such time as as that advice was received. Five days later, we still haven't received that advice, even though, as we sort of spoke about earlier, it's pretty clear cut that there was a definitely an appearance that things weren't all kosher. So we still don't have that advice. But at some point today, Christian Porter tendered his resignation as a minister. Now, the media release that accompanied that resignation was 1,600 words long, in which Porter rewrote some history from earlier in the year about what had happened, about the the thousands of people who supported his defamation case against the ABC, about the many people who came forward offering to help him with his legal fees, and that he, he wouldn't subject those people to a trial by mob by making their names available. And subsequently so he had so he would he would resign his ministry. Essentially what he's saying is I am going to keep the money. I'm not going to tell you how much I receive. I'm not going to tell you who gave it to me. And to make this all go away, I'm going to resign from the ministry. But I'm still going to be a federal MP sitting in parliament on the back bench. And we're essentially in the position where we're being asked to accept the fact that an MP can accept an undisclosed amount of money from undisclosed sources and that that would be okay. Now, granted, he's no longer a minister, so the ministerial codes of conduct no longer apply. But by God, accountability and integrity still do for a minister, like for a, a parliamentarian. And those have been thrown away. Yeah, I think it's a really important point that this is not a win for accountability and transparency. I got and, no. Yeah. So... It was quite the frisson of excitement when when the news broke that Porter had resigned. But again, as we look at it as, as it unfolds, like this is, it's just more of the same. It's more of the same dodging of accountability behaviour. And what I find fascinating is that Porter has, he, he's essentially chosen his anonymous benefactors over the people and yeah, over and his, look, yeah. And, and as, as someone pointed out earlier today, to protect the names of whoever gave him money, he is willing to to accept a pay cut of $150,000 a year. Wow. Now, I don't know about you, Elena, mm-hmm. but those would have to be pretty good friends. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I've got to be honest, Steve, I consider you a really good friend. Look, I love you, mate, but I'm not giving up 150 grand a year for you. <laughs> And well, I would you'd just out me, wouldn't you? You'd just <laughs> out me. You'd just, look, it was Steve. Steve gave him the money. If he's got a problem with being outed like this, he shouldn't have given it to me in the first place. I mean, exactly. uh, Scott Morrison came out and said, Porter is resigning in order to uphold the ministerial code and those standards, and that's the appropriate thing to do. But again, as, as someone pointed out, I think it might have been Paul Bongiorno, the, uh, the political journalist, pointed out, actually what he did was refuse to uphold the ministerial standards and so resigned as a minister. He wasn't adhering to them because he kept the money and he wouldn't disclose who gave it to him. So he essentially said, I refuse to abide by the standards Therefore, I'm going to resign as a minister so they no longer apply to me. It's the exact opposite of sh- of acting with integrity. Oh, my God, you were so right. And speaking of political journalists, Barry Cassidy took to Twitter today and said, the PM himself, apparently, and in brackets, subject to correction, never reached the point where he thought Porter should go. Yes, yes. Which, yeah. And we, we also had... The spectre of the spectacle of the finance minister on TV this morning being asked that question, well, was he acting improperly by accepting that money? 
oh, well, you know, nah, maybe, you know, I, I, I wouldn't like to speculate. What's that to speculate about? Some yeah. unknown person gives you a, a, a bunch of money. Would you accept it or not? Like, that's not, that's not speculating. too much. You know, like, that's that's not yeah. too hard a question. And we got exactly the same thing from Josh Frydenberg on oh, Thursday or Friday morning on Radio National where he said, oh, I, I don't want to deal in hypothetical. <laughs> this isn't a hypothetical, Josh. Sorry. <laughs> pretty much not a hypothetical. You know, yeah. would you do what Christian Porter did? Well, I wouldn't like to speculate. It's, yeah. This I'm is like... no better. I, I, I think it's it's really important to recognise and for listeners to understand that what Christian Porter has done is just as problematic, if not more problematic, by resigning. He essentially said, I refuse to live by the ministerial codes of, of conduct and, and live by those standards, so I'm no longer be, going to be a minister. I'm not going to tell you who gave me that money and I'm not going to tell you how much they gave me. And to protect their interests, I'm willing to give up $150,000 a year in, in a salary cut. Screams problem. Screams that there is something bad, <laughs> problematic, worrisome going on behind the scenes. This isn't any better at all. No, it really, really highlights the fact that uh, even even more so than than it was when this story first broke and he was still a minister, it really highlights the fact that we really need to know who these anonymous donors are because it, it's highly, highly problematic. It, it's absolutely yeah. mind-boggling. Yeah. If we had a, a federal integrity commission, like we were promised a thousand days ago by the this government, if we had a, a federal integrity commission, this would absolutely be something that they would begin investigating. It would have been referred to them as soon as it was disclosed. You need to look into this because this isn't this isn't okay. Yeah, straight away. And we don't have one. The person who was responsible for holding it up for six hundred of those one thousand days was Christian Porter. <laughs> The irony is exquisite, isn't it? So speaking of exquisite hot takes, Andrew P. Street is at it again, ever reliable. He said that, note that Porter is framing his decision to step down as a choice between outing his donors or maintaining his integrity as a minister. But there was a third option he didn't bother with, paying his own bills for the ill-advised defo suit he began and abandoned. It's not even the only third option. I mean, there are others. This is this is this is the silly part. Pay back the money and cover your own legal costs. That would be one way to do it. Disclose who it was. That would have been another way to do it. Actually, disclose the amount of money. Like we we don't even know whether we're arguing over fifty bucks or five hundred thousand. And at the moment, like the principle of the thing is actually pretty poor anyway. He saw fit to add it to his declaration of interest. So it, it must be a significant amount of money because the other thing he added there was $50,000 from the ABC. So it's probably not an insignificant sum of money, mm. but there are options. If he refuses to disclose, fine. If he refuses to pay back the money, fine. He shouldn't just have resigned from the ministry. He should have resigned from parliament, which should be talking about a by-election in the seat of Pierce in WA that should be what we're dealing with next week, not whether or not he deserves to be on the backbench. Yes, because really throughout this whole process from the start of the year to today, Porter has very adroitly avoided the investigation of whether or not he is a fit and proper person to be in Parliament representing the good people of Pierce. And at every turn, he's demonstrated that he is not came out as part of his statement said, like, I will sit the next federal election in my electorate and run for re-election again. So that's not really the, the actions of a person showing contrition or any kind of regret or any of that kind of thing. This is someone who's just sort of stepping back from the edge that they see in front of them only far enough that that attention goes away for a while. Yes. And to expand this beyond Porter, it says so much about the Liberal Party that apparently they're not going to challenge his pre-selection and dump him as a candidate and replace him with someone more fit for office. If he runs in Pierce in the next federal election, then he is literally endorsed by the Liberal Party. They think he's perfectly acceptable to represent the people of Pierce. And the smacks of him doing a Barnaby Joyce, going to the backbench in disgrace, Sitting back, biding his time, 
waiting to come forward again. And let's keep in mind that Christian Porter is a man who from childhood was firmly convinced of not just that he would be prime minister one day, that it's his birthright. My personal opinion is that he is going to cling to his his public office for as long as he can to one day fulfil. Yeah, th- this is a setback on his road to PM ship. This is not a, yeah. This week, the Prime Minister had multiple opportunities to call this out as unacceptable behaviour and, and to um, and I'll come back to the Prime Minister in a minute. Josh Frydenberg failed when he was asked about it. He dodged and weaved and, and didn't want to speculate and didn't want to deal in hypotheticals, but he also failed to call it a, unacceptable behaviour. Simon Birmingham Times this week also was directly asked the question, is it OK for a, a parliamentarian or a minister to accept money, etc.? Oh, I don't want to deal in hypotheticals. And then the Prime Minister, when he actually announced today that Porter had resigned, took the opportunity to thank the Minister for his wonderful service over many years in Cabinet, not just in his current role as the Minister for Industry, but also as the Attorney General, where it served not just my Cabinet, but a pre- There was a whole thing of what a magnificent gentleman this this person is, and, and it, it really is a shame that we lose his service. That's not a group of people saying this back acceptable. This is a group of people who are going, well, we're getting we're getting some bad publicity about this behaviour, so something needs to happen. But this is this is why they want to avoid scrutiny as much as possible, because the scrutiny that they do get tends to draw attention to the fact that their behaviour is appalling often. Mm. And it's it's not just that their um, their behaviour is appalling often. Their appalling behaviour is endemic. It's a feature. It's not a bug, as our, our software development people would it's say. It's not an exception. It's not an exception. Yeah. What What gets me is that Porter should never have been given the option to resign. He should have been sacked on the spot. Straight away. Yep. Yes. And look, he's being replaced by Angus Taylor. Angus Taylor has been given his responsibilities, at least temporarily. This is the same person who spent $80 million on non-existent water to a company that he had dealings with that was held offshore in the Cayman Islands, so no one could actually see who really owned it, like that Angus Taylor, the Angus Taylor who's responsible for emissions reductions, which we're not. Like, that's the guy that we're putting up to the plate to take his place. Yeah, the the Angus Taylor, who has so many scandals attached to his name, we've just done a collective Angus gate to hold them all. Because there's Watergate, there's Grassgate, there's Troublegate, there's... It's just all collected under Angus gate. This is the guy who's stepping up to replace Christian Porter, who in theory has resigned in disgrace. So Amber Robinson has said, imagine being accused of a serious crime, avoiding a criminal investigation, suing the media, being given a million dollars anonymously, losing your senior senior position for breaching ministerial standards, keeping your 200k a year job and still claiming to be a victim. It's a brilliant summary. Yeah, he's really he's he's really hard done by in in all of this. Yeah, there's no there's no ounce of taking responsibility. There's no sort of semblance of accountability in in any of this. I hope I hope the people of Pierce, the good people of Pierce, find somebody else to represent them at the next federal election and out of the next federal election because I'm certain they can do better. Yes, and. If the Liberal Party is not willing to provide a different person for those people to vote for, then good people of Pierce, you must vote for anyone but the Liberals. Is there a Voices of Pierce independent coming? I'm not sure. I have to go find that out. In fact, if it's there like, is a Voices it's got of Pierce. A huge publicity. <laughs> they should. I was going to say, if there's not one, then one needs to be formed very, very quickly. And reach out to us. We're happy to provide our support as another independent party. I think uh, on this particular issues, our values align. Well and truly. Steve, thank you so much for reconvening on your Sunday night, having given up your Friday night to talk about Bloody Christian Porter. Deeply grateful. And um, uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on this and we'll update everyone as the saga unfolds. Thanks, Elena.
So as Steve said, not a win for accountability or transparency. In fact, we just saw the Morrison government trample all over the concept of accountability yet again. As political cartoonist Kathy Wilcox noted on Twitter, I am stepping down from my role of deeply conflicted minister to resume the role of deeply conflicted backbencher. At the time of recording, Christian Porter has managed to not only keep the money donated to him from anonymous and therefore highly questionable sources, he's managed to keep his job as an MP. I don't know about you, but all the industries I've worked in over the years have very clear guidelines on accepting gifts from suppliers, vendors and customers, and breaching those guidelines is a sackable offence. But once again, we see that in Scott Morrison's government, nobody manages to get sacked for misconduct. Replacing the scandal-damaged Christian Porter with the scandal-damaged Angus Taylor shows how little talent there is in this government. They are really strapped for halfway competent, untarnished people to help run the country. Former Australian Democrats President Lisa Reske wrote an article for our website called What is a Bastard? and she listed all the ways to spot bastard behaviour in sitting politicians and what to do about it. Elisa writes, I say a bastard is anyone in a position of political power who puts their own selfish goals, vested interests or personal ideologies above the needs of the Australian people. I've put a link in the show notes. It's well worth reading. Also worth reading are the articles from Michael Bradley and Andrew P. Strait. You can support Andrew's Patreon from as little as $3 a month. That's my personal recommendation. He is tops. You've just got done listening to how Christian Porter is a capital B bastard, but it's becoming increasingly clear that this applies to the entire government. And this government is incapable of redeeming its bastard behaviour. Already, they're laying the groundwork for Porter to return to Cabinet in the future. The only thing we can do is kick these bastards out. The good people of Pius can lead the way with kicking out Christian Porter. If you want to help us return to Parliament and keep the bastards on us, join us. Your support is incredibly important, as we still need to meet the new party membership requirement of having at least 1,500 members to maintain our party registration. As we explored in a previous episode, another bastard move from this government to eliminate political competition and entrench the duopoly of the two major parties. Join us, won't you? And do your bit for democracy. I've put a link in the show notes to join for free. Keep the Bastards Honest is brought to you by the Australian Democrats. This episode was edited and produced by me, Alana Mitchell. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram by searching for Australian Democrats and you can see what we stand for, what we value and what our policy positions are at our website at democrats.org.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.